Hello, hello. Um, so Saturday I was going to have a conversation about something more funny, and then instead, um, I got hit by a really intense grief wave. So, yeah, I didn't record. Um, so today I guess I want to talk a little bit about grief. I'm, I'm not sure how deep I want to go just yet because I am still very much in the thick of it. Um, I lost Jordan <clears throat> June 21st, 2020. So a little over 14 months ago. And, you know, I lost my mom when I was 16 and I, it was a very different loss. I was a very different age. The circumstances were different and I, I was so hardened to trauma in my young age that I I just kind of shut down. I didn't really grieve. And I mean, I did a little, but I shut down. I remember going to my room after she died and I had a mixtape because it was the 90s. And the first song on one side of my tape was um, One Sweet Day by Mariah Carey and Boys to Men. And I played that song over and over and over. I just kept rewinding and replaying it. And still to this day, I can't hear that song and not cry. Um, it, but I didn't cry. I didn't cry for her for months and months. Um, A lot of things from our childhood we learned to not cry because you would get in bigger trouble. You would it, it just emotions were not not recommended. So I had got pretty tough at that age that crying was not a thing. And then I got pregnant, <laughs> and hormones will fuck you over. Um, and yeah, so now little things can make me cry. My <laughs> My hormone imbalance has been steady and balanced ever since then. Thanks a lot to my son. Um, but with Jordan, I have been in touch with my emotions for years. And I was at a place in my life that I didn't need to be so tough because I had someone by my side to help bear the weight of life. And... Um, so yeah, I, I cried. I cried a lot. I cried every single day for, jeez, <laughs> uh, for like the first 13 months. I think early August was my first day I didn't cry. And I was like, oh my God, a whole day. I didn't cry. Not once, not a single tear. <laughs> I was really proud of myself. <laughs> um, and man, there, it was just a very different loss, losing a life partner, someone you chose to be a part of your family, someone that you plan on doing the rest of your life with. It's a very different loss. And like a lot of people, I always heard that, you know, there's the stages of grief and I don't know if it's seven or nine or whatever. And I was just like, okay, I did this stage, this is done. But then it would like, in one hour, I could roll through all the different emotions of grief and then start recycling back through them. And not necessarily in the same order. I saw this uh, image about the path of grief and it was sort of like a UV sort of shape like this. And it had like this, 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 you know, like the little different things. And you're supposed to travel in this way is, you know, you know, when you come to, you know, the, the hard grief and then you, you know, get down in the low, low, and then you start coming up on the high again and you start recovering. But in this, you know, that's what they make you feel that that's what grief is because you're first in shock and stun and disbelief. And I think that's the initial everyone, you know, that kind of denial. But just because you accept that this person's actually gone doesn't mean you don't cycle back to denial. 
And, it, and so it gives the impression that you first kind of have this numbness. So you're, you're not fully in the depths of grief. And then as you realize it's reality, that's when you sink really low. And then you start coming up on the other end. Well, in this, this is what we're led to believe is the process of grief. But in this image, it was like the, what you're led to believe and the reality, I wish I had the image. I wish I knew how to superimpose it onto the screen, but the reality of it is all these squibble squabbles all across and it kind of looks a little like a hairy vagina um, because it's all these squiggly lines connecting to each one back and forth and all around and just looping and zigzagging and, and swirling all back and forth because that's the reality of grief. Emotions don't work in just a linear way. Emotions can be a whole collection of things. It can be a combination of things that you feel at once. Thus my split face gal because it it. Emotions are emotions. They're very chaotic. They're all over the place and you feel how you feel. And yeah, you can block them and you can shut them down for a minute, but ultimately they're still going to creep back up. And so, um, like I have moments, it's been 25 years since my mom passed and there's still things that will set me off, that will make me cry, that will make me miss her it, just exponentially. And there's so many moments in my life where I'm like, I wish I had my mom here I could talk to. I wish I had, you know, I mean, you think about them all the time, no matter how long they've been gone. They're just still a part of your life. And the hurt, you, you, it's, it's not that it fades. It's that you get more accustomed to dealing and to having their loss be a part of your reality. It's just, you get used to it. You get used to that burden being a part of your life. It's not that you miss them less. It's not that you love them less. It's not that you forget them because you don't because people leave an impact on your life, especially if they're really close and a really important part of your everyday life. And they leave that imprint on you. And so, yeah, it's not just a linear thing. And that's something I came to learn really intensely with Jordan. Because with my mom, I, I blocked so much out. And I was so young. that, And then I was pregnant within the year. And I had other things I had to focus on. And it was a great distraction. Um, and then I left the cult. And then, yeah. So I had so many things going on back then that... I just didn't have time to really think and focus on exactly how I'm feeling and how I'm doing. And this time around, I'm older, I'm grown, I'm, I'm more self-aware. And so it hits me in a different way. And I'm more cognizant of what's going on with myself, with my brain and with my heart. And so it just weighs differently. And um, I think I mentioned before in my suicide video that I... I was very, I wouldn't exactly call my, I wasn't actively suicidal. There is a difference between suicidal ideology, suicidal, you know, fantasizing um, about no longer existing in the world and actually wanting to harm yourself. I didn't want to harm myself, but I did want to no longer exist. And for a good 10 months, approximately, that's where my head was. Every day, I did not want to do this. I did not want to wake up another day and have to deal with this pain. It was a lot. It is a lot. Um, <laughs> and I remember being really, I used to always joke, I have a terrible poker face because I'm quite emotional. I get excited. I'm very animated. People generally know how I feel. But I was really impressed that apparently a lot of people thought I was doing much, much better than I was doing. And I guess maybe my poker face is better than I presumed. Um, but early April, I or no, no, not early April, late April, I had my first OK day and I was like, oh, my God. This is a delicate flower. Do not fuck up this day. <laughs> and and I woke up not being mad that I was alive and and luckily the day went well and that just happened to be 420 and the day that the Chauvin trial concluded the verdict came in um, not concluded because then sentencing happened after but the day of the verdict which the verdict was the right verdict I absolutely believe and um, so it ended up being 
an okay day. I still cried, but it was an okay day. And that day, actually, it was tears of joy and then sadness because Jordan wasn't here to witness it. Um, but um, back in July, I met up with um, oh, some of the WIDs from our widow support group and in Denver. And there was something about that experience that was just really healing. It was really healing. I mean, I've talked to these people for the last year and, you know, every week pretty much. And even sometimes throughout the week, if I have someone I need to reach out to, I have a whole team that one of them will be free and have the time and relate to what I'm talking about. So it's wonderful to have the support team. And it, <laughs> grief is this, again, it's this funny thing. You have to do it alone. You do. You can have all this support around you, but ultimately you're the one who's dealing with it. And I, I have family who has been really good support. We've set up our, like, what our what our commitment is like how often we call this is what is helpful from you this is something you can do because I don't want to inconvenience anybody in my grief and I don't want to become a burden and so you know we've made like social contracts between me and various of my siblings um, about this is something like this would be helpful for me from you and this is is this something that can work within your schedule and your life so I'm not inconveniencing you because so many people want to help but they don't know how to help and so maybe having a communication having a conversation about this would be helpful to me and they go oh okay like I talk a lot anyone who's watched any of my videos I talk a lot so if you get me on the phone you're gonna talk to me for probably an hour or two if you're not good at saying, "Hun, I got to go. Love you, but I got to go, which is fine. I don't get hurt by that, but that's fine. But some people, because they know I'm in pain, they're going to stay on longer and then they're disrupting their whole life. And I don't want to do that. So I'm like, how about instead of phone calls, send me memes or just shoot me a text or, you know, do something that's not going to kill all your day and all your time and what you got to do. Let's do this because this is something you can do that makes me feel cared for and makes me feel supported and it doesn't infringe on your time and your activities. And so there are ways to do this if you communicate. Communication is so important. And so, but anyways, the whole reason I felt like talking about grief again was because since, since July, I have started to do much, much better. I talked about, um, if reconnecting in a, I mean, I've been connected with my dad, but having a very healing moment with him, I've been reaching out to people that enhance my life and that just, I just enjoy their presence, their company, interacting with them. I don't need people that drain my energy. I need people that help boost me and hopefully I can do the same for them. And so that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking for. I want to invest my energy in people that help not hurt me in people that, and I'm, I'm learning how to set my boundaries because there's so, because I'm so overwhelmed with grief, I don't have energy to really expand what, you know, I have a hard time empathizing, well, not empathizing, but caring too much about other people's problems because uh, so many of them seem petty because it's not, they're not petty. Problems are valid no matter what they are. But right now, the problem I'm dealing with is I lost the love of my life. And so my problem just is so overwhelming that I have a hard time finding energy to feel bad about a little thing. Because to me, it's such a small thing. And so I'm, I hate dismissing someone else's problem, but I don't have energy for it. So for people who have problems that aren't life and death, I just, I, I just say your problem is valid. Please talk to someone who can validate your problem. Just right now, I don't have the energy for it. I don't want to dismiss it. I just don't have the energy for it. 
because I'm so consumed with this really heavy weight of how my life is going to be without this person. Like, he wasn't my other half. We were <laughs> intertwined. Or we, the, there was so much, like, losing him, I feel like half of me just got ripped away. And maybe more than half. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really struggling to stand that I don't have the energy to worry about other things. And I hate that because I usually am a very empathetic person and I usually enjoy like validate other people's problems. I'm just so consumed with mine right now that my energy tank is just really, really low. And, and then I got only, and, um, me and Jordan's sister made an amends. Apparently there wasn't as much conflict as I thought there was. We just lacked communication. So my mind went to some crazy places and so as it will, I have a overactive imagination. And so, yeah, I have her dog only here and she's such a love, such a joy. She gets me out of the house. She gets me moving around. My whole body aches from walking this girl because she just has so much energy and so much love. She's such a sweetheart. Um, and so these last like month and a half, couple months have been going honestly quite well. I've still had moments where I've cried and I've still had moments where I'm down. And of course, Jordan is constantly in my mind, but I've been coping really, really well. And then Saturday night, <laughs> um, I got a text from a client, just an innocent text talking about they want to get in in the next week or two and they want to do a little bit of red in their hair color because fall is coming. It's a normal text for me to get. I'm a hairstylist. This is normal stuff. Um, I broke down. <laughs> I don't know what all my triggers are. And I don't know if that'll trigger me in the future. But it affected me. I instantly had a meltdown. I had a panic attack. I... My hands were shaking. I was instantly in tears. I dropped the phone. Luckily, I was sitting, so I just dropped it in my lap and not on the floor. It was a very dramatic moment, and I was so taken aback by it. Like, I know grief comes in waves, and I was just riding a higher wave. I still had grief, so I was like, okay, so this is where I'm going to be at. I'll be, like, mostly happy while still having my grief that I'm dealing with. But no, this went, boom, just pushed me down. Like, I felt like I was just, if you've ever gotten knocked down by a wave and you get twirled under the water and you're getting all that sand and the broken shells and you get all scuffed up, that's what it felt like just emotionally, not physically. Um, man, it was really, really overwhelming. And I was like, how silly is this? It's a normal thing. Fall colors. I want to do some red for fall. I've been doing hair for almost 20 years. This is a normal conversation. I should be able to handle this just fine. I did compose myself and text her back about 20 minutes later. I I still disappointed in the delay in my response, but I, I feel like it was okay. And we're, we're still working on finding an appointment time that works for her. But um, I was just really overwhelmed and it sunk me really low for a minute. Now, this is not her fault. She was asking a very normal question. This is the thing with triggers. There's a lot of things that will upset you in life. There's a lot of things, like I didn't even know that was going to be a trigger. And it's not the other person's responsibility. I got triggered the other day. I was having a good day. I was smiling, rocking out to some music. And I saw a young black man walking and instantly burst into tears because there was something in the way he dressed and a bit of the way he walked. It wasn't exactly like Jordan, but it just had enough of his awkward walk that it reminded me ever so slightly of Jordan. And there came the tears. That's not his fault. He's just out there living his life. It's not my, the, my client's fault. She wants red in the fall. That's just normal stuff. But for me, it set me in a bit of a tailspin. That tailspin is my responsibility to find my way out. 
and I do have people I can call, but I decided I was going to try to <laughs> find my own way out if I could. If I couldn't, I knew I had people to call. So, but in the meantime, and luckily, I can't say I pulled myself out entirely on my own because the animals, man, they're the real ones, aren't they? They just, they just give you the love. They give you the entertainment. They, yeah, they helped. I listened to some music, some amazing music. There is a band called Bloody Wood. Um, I would love to actually do a whole video about how amazing I think they are, but I have asked permission to talk about them. Um, but I think I can talk just as someone I've talked about other artists and their music. So I came across one of their songs. I've been listening to them for a few months now, and I really do like their music. I hadn't heard this one song of theirs called Givedi. I think it is pronounced. Um, and it's a song about depression and suicide and which is some heavy shit, and it's a really good song. If I remember how to do it right, I'll try to link the song in the in the the, the description. I think that's where you can do it. Man, I suck at this technology stuff. I don't know why I'm allowed on YouTube, um, but it that song just really made me feel powerful. And um, the line "Jivedi" it means "Live, brave one." And that really, that struck me because I, I was, I was feeling not so strong in that moment. And yeah, anyways, I ended up messaging the guitarist, just telling him, um, um, Karan Katyar, I believe his name is. And I just messaged him, which I was like, I'm sorry if I'm being <laughs> overstepping here, but I just had to let them know their music just it it hit the spot and it really was helpful and I seriously have been waking up every day since Saturday with that song stuck in my head and yeah I I think I needed that message that you know you can get back up if you're still alive um and so yeah and luckily when I was in my <laughs> bit of a spiral on Saturday. I, I wasn't thinking about giving up. I was just feeling really, really overwhelmed. And this is the thing. This is grief. It's been over 14 months and I've been doing quite well for all intents and purposes. And, and then it just, shit can just hit you out of the blue and you don't even know what your triggers are going to be. And, you know, some things I can predict. There's certain things that, you know, I just know are going to be a little problematic. There's certain songs I have trouble listening to because they were some of his favorite and they're ones that talk about loss or leaving the world or things like that. Or, and so there's certain things I already kind of know, but some triggers you don't know and you're not prepared for when they come and get you. So yeah, it's, it's how, how you react and how you respond to your triggers. That's what really defines who you are. You know, and you can let yourself get knocked down and you can let yourself get back up again. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to have a rough day. It's okay. It's okay. But you're responsible for your actions. If you let it yourself lash out at other people, you're responsible for that. And now you're inflicting pain on other people. So if someone's triggering you and something's bothering you, it's okay that you're feeling that way. But to lash out at other people is not a good way to do it. Luckily, there was no one here for me to lash out at. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. And I did have a vent session later on with my son, but that was a completely separate problem. Um, nothing to do with with grief or anything and I did just kind of need a rant about something not rant I don't know everything's a rant if you're upset I guess um but yeah we ended up having a great night but yeah that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about and now my brain's starting to get scattered again <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm gonna call it a video 
at this point. But yeah, I just really want to stress grief is a very complex thing. If you have a friend who's grieving, no matter how long it's been since they've lost their partner, it could be years. It could be, well, their partner, their parent, their child, their friend. It could be years and they could still have a rough day. They could still have several rough days. They could have whole chunks of time. There's things you don't know. And this is one of the messages that they give in the song, Shivedi, is that you don't know what other people are going through. So maybe have a little kindness and, you know, show a little care because you never know just how rough things are going for the person that cut you off in traffic or that, you know, said something lashed out a little bit. You don't know what they're going through and, you know, maybe have a little grace for people. Man, 2019. 20 was a rough fucking year for a lot of people, you know, and probably most people, really. And then if you had anything additional to carry on your shoulders, it makes it a just... 2020 was supposed to be the year we got married. And it turned into a very different year. And a lot of people are struggling. So maybe have some grace. 